Good afternoon, Coach Slack here once again, continuing our readings on the Synaxarian of the Latin Triodian and Pentecostarian, the Sunday of Orthodoxy. On this day, the first Sunday of Great Lent, we celebrate the restoration of the holy and venerable icons by the ever-memorable rulers of Constantinople, the Emperor Michael and his mother, the Empress Theodora, during the Patriarchate of St. Methodius the Confessor. It was with God's permission that when St. Hermanos had taken up the rudder of the church, Leo the Asurian seized the center of the empire after having been a mule driver and manual laborer. The patriarch was summoned immediately to hear the emperor say, In my opinion, Bishop, the holy images are no different from idols. Therefore, I command that they be removed from among us as soon as possible. If it should be the case that they are the true forms of the saints, however, then at least see that they be hung up high so that we who are stained by sin may not soil them with our kisses. The patriarch sought to turn the emperor away from such hatred, saying, God forbid, emperor, that you should rage against the holy images, for we hear that some have nicknamed you the one who plasters over. And he replied, But I say this myself, that I was called this from childhood. Thus, when the patriarch could not be persuaded to agree, the emperor sent him into exile and placed him with Anastasius, who shared the imperial opinions. And so it was that the battle against the holy images broke out. It is said that it was the Jews who first instilled such great hatred in the emperor at the time when he was poor and doing business with them through his livelihood as a mule driver, and that they had helped him to rise to the throne through some kind of sorcery. When Leo's evil life came suddenly to an end, his like-minded whelp, Constantine Copronimus, Copronimus, Capronimus, that namesake of Dung, succeeded not only to be seated on the imperial throne, but even more to rage against the holy images. But what is the necessity in telling how many evils this lawless man did? When he died in an even worse manner than his father, his son by the Khazar woman was set up as emperor, and after he had measured out his life in evil doing, Constantine and then Irene inherited the imperial throne. They were guided by the Most Holy Patriarch Tarsius to convoke the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 787, and so the Holy Church of Christ received the holy images back again. After these two had laid down their rule, Nikitas Genikius ascended the imperial throne, and then his son Stavrikius, and after him Michael Rangavi. All of these reverenced the divine images. <clears throat> Michael was succeeded by the brutal Leo the Armenian, who had been corrupted by a certain monk, an impious recluse, and he gave rise to the second war against the images, throwing the Church of God once more into disorder. Leo was succeeded by Michael Amorius, and Michael in turn by Theophilus, a true sign of the frenzy against the images, which who was the worst of all. Now this Theophilus both persecuted many of the Holy Fathers with monstrous punishments and tortures for the sake of the Holy Images, and insisted that his cause was just. It is said, though, that once, while he was proceeding through the crowds in Constantinople, he looked for someone of the same opinion, and was unable, unable to find such a one for many days. After he had ruled as emperor for twelve years, he fell ill with dysentery. With his life about to end, his mouth opened up so wild, wide that his insides could be seen within. The Augusta Theodora, who had been greatly distressed by this development, had just fallen asleep when she saw in a dream the Immaculate Mother of God embracing the babe who is older than eternity, encircled by rows of angels who were whipping and cursing her husband, Theophilus. Just as sleep departed from her, Theophilus recovered enough to cry out, Woe is me, the wretched one. I am being scourged because of the holy images. At once the empress placed upon him the image of the mother of God and prayed to her with tears. As for Theophilus, even though he was so ill, when he saw one of the onlookers wearing a medallion with an image on it, he took hold of it and kissed it. Immediately the mouth which had railed against the holy images and the throat which had been gaping wide were restored to their original state. His whole condition eased, and he fell into sleep, though not before confessing that it is good to honor and venerate the holy images. The empress then removed the venerable and holy images from her storage chest in order to kiss them and honor them with all her heart and to prepare Theophilus for his death. Shortly after he departed his life, 
Theodora recalled all those who had been exiled or imprisoned and ordered that they be allowed to live in safety. She also deposed John the Grammarian from the patriarchal throne, for he had really been more like a pharaoh's magician. Giannis, a master of divin divination and a consorter with demons, then a patriarch. He was replaced by the confessor of Christ, Methodius, who had previously suffered greatly and had even lived sequestered in a tomb. At the same time, a kind of divine visitation happened to the great Eunicius, who was living the ascetic life in the mountains of Olympus. The great ascetic, Arsacius, came to him and said, God has sent me to you so that we should both go to that most venerable man, Isaiah, the recluse from Nicomedia, in order to learn from him what is pleasing to God and fitting for the church herself. So both of them went to the most venerable Isaiah and heard from him the following. Thus says the Lord, Behold, the end draws near for the enemies of my form. You, therefore, when you have gone to the Empress Theodora and to the Patriarch Methodius as well, will speak as follows. Put a stop to all the unholy men. Then together with the angels you may offer sacrifice to me by honoring the image of my form and that of the cross. When they heard this, they went directly to the city of Constantine and announced to the Patriarch Methodius and to all God's chosen ones what had been said to them. After this gathering, they all went to the Empress and persuaded her with evidence from the fathers, for she was devout and a lover of God. The Empress immediately held up the image of the Mother of God that was hanging about her neck and kissed it, saying, If, for love's sake, anyone does not kiss and venerate these images in a relative manner, not worship, worshiping them as gods, but as images of their archetypes, let him be an anathema. And they rejoiced with great joy. In turn, however, the Empress asked them to intercede for her husband, Theophilus. After, although at first they were taken aback, they accepted her request because they had seen her faith. Then the saintly Methodius gathered all the clergy and people, including the bishops in the great church of God. Those present included the following select ascetics from Olympus, the great Ionicius and Arsacius, both Nacradius and the disciples of Theodore the Studite and Theophanes of the great field and Theodore, the writers and confessors. There were also Michael of the Holy City and Sincellus, although, along with many others, Today, together they celebrated an all-night intercession to God for the sake of Theophilus, all of them praying with tears and concentrated petition. And they repeated this throughout the whole first week of the fast. The Empress Theodora was doing the same thing as well, together with the women and the rest of the people. At dawn on that Friday, the Empress Theodora fell asleep and had a dream. She seemed to find herself at the column of the cross, and some men were noisily passing by, and going along the road carrying different instruments of torture. In the middle of them, being led bound with his hands tied behind his back, was the emperor Theophilus. On recognizing him, she joined the group as it was making its way. When she reached the bronze gate, she saw a man with a supernatural countenance sitting in front of the image of Christ, and Theophilus was standing opposite him. The empress touched the man's feet, pleading with him for the emperor, and he straightway opened his mouth. Great is your faith, woman, he said. Know then that, for the sake of your tears and your faith, and for the sake of the intercessions and petitions of my servants and my priests, I grant forgiveness to Theophilus, your husband. Then he said to the men, Untie him and give him to his wife. And on receiving him back, she went away, greatly rejoicing. At that moment, the dream came to an end. While this was what the Empress Theodora saw, the Patriarch Methodius, after the prayers and intercessions for the Emperor were finished, took an ordinary piece of paper and wrote down on, on it all the names of the heretical emperors, and he included Theophilus among them. Taking the paper, he placed it underneath the holy table. On Friday, he also had a vision. He saw a frightening angel entering in at the great doors and coming towards him. The angel said, Your petition has been heard, Bishop. And the Emperor Theophilus has been granted forgiveness. Neither you nor the others need trouble God about him any longer. The Patriarch, though, in order to test whether the vision had been true or not, went down from his place and took up the paper and unrolled it. He found, oh, the judgments of God, that God has, had entirely removed Theophilus's name from the list. When the Empress was informed of this, she was exceedingly glad. Therefore, on the first Sunday of Great Lent, March 11th, 843, she ordered the Patriarch to assemble in the church all the people with candles and the holy images and precious crosses. 
so that the holy images might be restored, and so that this latest miracle might be known to all. When all had gathered in the church with candles, the empress and her son Michael joined them in a solemn procession with the holy images, with the divine and august fragments of the true coughs, and with the holy and divine gospel book, singing, Lord have mercy. They went out to what is called the milestone, and then turned back towards the church, where they celebrated the divine liturgy. Once more the holy images were set in place, in the great church by certain chosen men. Those who had been devout and had rightly justified the images were proclaimed, and the impious who had opposed them and not accepted the honor of the holy images were denounced and surrendered to anathema. From that time forward the venerable confessors ordained that this holy feast should be taken place annually to ensure that we do not tumble again into the same iniquity. We should know that the empress, the holy empress Theodora, is commemorated on February the 11th, and the venerable patriarch Methodius on June the 14th. O Christ our God, depicted and honored on the holy images through the intercessions of your holy confessors, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Homily, the development of doctrine by St. Vincent, Vincent of Larens. Is there to be no development of religion in the Church of Christ? Certainly, there is to be development and on the largest scale. Who can be so grudging to men, so full of hate for God, as to try to prevent it? But it must truly be development of the faith, not alteration of the faith. Development means that each thing expands to be itself, while alteration means that a thing is changed from one thing into another. The understanding, knowledge, and wisdom of one and all, of individuals as well as the whole church, ought then to make great and vigorous progress with the passing of the ages and the centuries, but only along its own line of development, that is, with the same doctrine, the same meaning, and the same import. The religion of souls should follow the law of development of bodies. Though bodies develop and, and unfold their component parts with the passing of the years, they always remain what they were. There is a great difference between the flower of childhood and the maturity of age, but those who become old are the very same people who were once young. Though the condition and appearance of one and the same individual may change, it is one and the same nature, one and the same person. The tiny members of unweaned children and the grown members of young men are still the same members. Men have the same number of limbs as children. Whatever develops at a later age was already present in seminal form. There is nothing new in old age that was not already latent in childhood. There is no doubt, then, that the legitimate and correct rule of the development, the established and wonderful order of growth, is this. In older people, the fullness of years always brings to completion those members and forms that the wisdom of the Creator fashioned beforehand in their earlier years. If, however, the human form were to turn into some shape that did not belong to its own nature, or even if something were added to the sum of its members or subtracted from it, the whole body would necessarily perish or become grotesque or at least be enfeebled. In the same way, the doctrine of the Christian religion should properly follow these laws of development, that is, by becoming firmer over the years, more ample in the course of time, more exalted as it advances in age. In ancient times, our ancestors sowed the good seed in the harvest field of the church. It would be very wrong and unfitting if we, their descendants, were to reap, not the genuine wheat of truth, but the intrusive growth of error. On the contrary, what is right and fitting is this, there should be no inconsistency between first and last, but we should reap true doctrine, doctrine from the growth of true teaching, so that when, in the course of time, those first sowings yield and increase, it may flourish and be tended in our day also, through the prayers of our venerable Father Vincent, O Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.